Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome to a wonderful event this afternoon to celebrate John Barton's new book, Better Religion, a primer for interreligious peace building, published with Baylor University Press. I'm Jennifer Smith. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Faith and Learning, and I've had the pleasure of organizing this session with Stephanie Cupp, CFL's Fearless Program Administrator, and Jeff Bowen, Director of Libraries uh, here at Payson Library. Um, I, uh, of library programming here at Payson Library. Um, I'll also be serving as moderator here today. We're going to start with some brief introductions of each of the speakers. Then John's going to provide us an introduction of his book. And then after that, each of our respondents will have a chance to uh, share their own reflections about uh, John's place in the larger interreligious world. But first, a couple of announcements, because we have to do that too. Um, the libraries also want to invite everyone for their next event, which is part of the alumni author lecture series with Troy Scenic, a graduate of the School of Public Policy. He'll be discussing his new book, A Man of Iron, The Turbulent Life and Improbable Presidency of Grover Cleveland. It's happening right here next Friday, February 10th at noon. Um, and also, I'm sure some of you saw as you came into the room, we do have a rare book in the room with us today. You'll be hearing more about it in just a minute. Um, but please, we do ask, there is some food and drink in the room. Please do keep those uh, items away from the book um, and avoid touching the volume itself. Uh, though I do hope that after the event is over, you come over and take a look at that. Um, so let us begin with introductions. First, let us welcome Rachel Gould. Dr. Gould is an assistant professor of English at Seaver College at Pepperdine University, where she examines the influences of Ottoman and Islamic culture on the development of British fiction in the 18th century. She met John after joining Seaver and discovering that they share a same alma mater, Harding University. They also learned that they share another desire, which is to help students engage with the way that religion shapes the world. Uh, our other speaker, I believe, is probably still looking for parking, but hopefully when he joins us, um, Sikh Simran Singh. Dr. Singh is the Judge uh, Danny Weinstein Managing Director of the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution at Pepperdine University Caruso School of Law. It's a long title. Where he also serves as Associate Professor of Law and Practice and directs the LLM programs. Sikh Simran has worked often with John over the years at the Strauss Institute. We also have with us today Michal Muhlenberg. Dr. Muhlenberg is the Managing Director of Islamic Studies Initiatives and an Affiliate Asso Assistant Professor in Islamic Studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. She's also the co-founder of Two Faiths, One Friendship, a nonprofit focused on peace education. Michal and John have worked together for several years on Muslim-Christian interfaith dialogue events. And if you haven't uh, read the book yet, you'll find out she has uh, a, a couple cameos in Better Religion. And last, but certainly not least, John Barton. Since 2017, John has served ably as the director for the Center for Faith and Learning here at Pepperdine, but where he also wears many other hats as well. In addition to his work at the Center, he's also a faculty member with GSEP's Program in Social Entrepreneurship and Change, with Caruso School of Law's Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution, and he's a professor of teaching in Seaver College's Religion and Philosophy Division, winning last year's highest teaching award, the Howard A. White Award for Teaching Excellence. And as if that weren't enough, his extracurricular activities are just as significant. He's currently serving as the president of Kibo Group, a nonprofit organization dedicated to empower every community in the Busogo region of Uganda. He's a board member of Missio Dei Foundation, an organization devoted to furthering reflection on the theology and practice of mission among churches of the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement. He is also co-host of the podcast Callings for NetView, the network for vocation in undergraduate education. John, as you can see, is one of those people who isn't afraid to cross borders, whether disciplinary, national, or religious to develop the friendships that make good conversation, like the one that we're about to have today. Please join me in welcoming John Barton.
Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is um, a special event. Thank you for Stephanie and Jennifer for putting it together. And for my friends uh, on the panel, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. And thank you for reading the book. Um, so thank you uh, for all of that. I have seven minutes to say something about my book, so I'm going to jump right in here. Enough with introductions. Um, so let me start just by acknowledging a few things that this book is and a few things that it, it is not. This is a big picture interdisciplinary study of global religion and the prospects for interreligious peace building across the planet. A uh, small little goal there, but that, that's what it is. It is not, and this is important, it is not a work of theology. I do not attempt to give a Christian take on interreligious peace building. This book is not written simply for a Christian audience. I do make my Christian commitments clear in the book. But this is written for a wider audience, and I see myself as a Christian participant in a wider discussion. And so I hope when people read this book, I hope that my friends and readers who are Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Baha'i, and non-religious, some who are in the room and with us today, and at least one that's supposed to be on his way, <laughs> will find something helpful here as much as my Christian readers and fellow Christians. This is also not a how-to manual. I do not offer the five steps to interreligious peace building or the seven habits of effective peace builders or anything like that. It's not my goal. This is a concept book that assumes that for interreligious peace building to be possible in the first place, we must be able to imagine it, to see it as something coherent and possible in our fragmented world. You got to picture what you want to pursue. And so I try to offer a picture. And I do so by offering a toolbox of resources. I introduce terminology, I assess theories, I do data analysis, I interpret historical events, I do a lot of things in this book, and I do all of that to try to help us to imagine what interreligious peace building looks like in today's world. Just a note about the, the book's title, Better Religion. Better Religion is actually a, a play on words. In one sense, the better of better religion simply acknowledges that most people think that their own religion is uniquely true, better than the alternatives. Christians certainly think that about Christ. Muslims certainly think that about the Quran. Buddhists think that about the Dharma, and so on. The point is, religious people are often divided on what makes for better religion. And interreligious peace building, if it's going to be effective, must start with that acknowledgement. But there's another sense. The better and better religion is also aspirational and, I hope, unifying. It refers to the need for people from all different religious traditions to mobilize their better angels. Those aspects of their traditions that promote empathy, compassion, humility, golden rule kindness. And when religious people do that, we find remarkable alliances become possible. So with that, that's kind of what the book is and what it isn't. With my very few remaining minutes, let me say something about the actual content, and I will do that by highlighting one claim, one metaphor, and one historical example, all very briefly. The claim. Here's the major claim of the book. Interreligious peace building has never been more important. And that reflects the fact that despite what many assume, religions are growing in our world in numbers and impact across the planet. And religions are intermingling with one another more than at any point in human history. So given those facts, interreligious peace building is not just relevant, it's urgent. Religions will have a major impact on the 21st century, how the 21st century turns out, for better or worse. It can go either way. And I write to draw attention to that urgency and to promote the better. The metaphor. The, metaphor, the central metaphor of the book is the metaphor of a bridge. I, will use, I use that metaphor to explore how effective interreligious peace building can be imagined in our world. A bridge, of course, is something that stretches over an otherwise impassable chasm. There's a river, there's a ravine, there's a highway, something that you can't cross, and a bridge connects the opposite sides and makes it crossable. And it does so, and this is important for the metaphor, it does so by virtue of separate foundations on opposite shores, which make it possible for the girders and beams to be extended. I imagine something analogous for interreligious peace building. 
Different traditions have independent resources, different theological foundations, different religious shores. And sometimes those foundations are theologically compatible with one another, and sometimes they're mutually exclusive. But either way, I'm claiming, they can still provide ethical resources that make the girders and the beams of interreligious peace building possible. One little side note here, part of what I'm doing in this book is I'm challenging several assumptions in the world of peace studies. First, I directly challenge the idea that religious differences or religious exclusivisms are inevitably a barrier to peace. I don't think they are. Secondly, I challenge or I at least nuance the idea that for peace to be possible, we must first establish common ground with one another. I think at best that is partially true. We can, in fact, build bridges of collaboration on important things, even when we don't share common ground religiously, even when we disagree on ultimate matters, which leads to my third and final thing, a historical example. I give many in the book, but right now I'll mention the historical example of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade in the UK. The African slave trade by 1800 was the largest forced migration in human history. As we know, injustices and suffering on a massive scale, often, by the way, perpetrated by Christians, which also shows what religion is capable of at its worst. But it was banned in the British Parliament in 1807. The slave trade was slavery itself banned in 1833. What made that possible is a much longer story, and it involved years of grassroots activism by women and men, many whose names we don't know who have been lost to history, many who escaped slavery themselves. And that story and that struggle continues. That's why Black History Month is important. But at the time, the grassroots work eventually bubbled up and made the legislative changes in Parliament possible. And there were many key players in the changing of that legislation. I mentioned just two. William Wilberforce. Christians love to highlight William Wilberforce, and for good reason. He was a member of the British Parliament. He was an evangelical Christian. He was opposed to slavery because he thought it was evil. He thought it was a sin. It's a sin to enslave other human beings created in the image of God. It was a sin because it went against the law of love of Jesus. But one of his collaborators, an influential person in the UK society at the time, was Jeremy Bentham, an influential atheist, a staunch critic of religion. He considered all religions to be outdated superstitions that hold back human progress. He's the father of utilitarianism, that secular approach to ethics in which morality is determined by calculating the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people, and slavery failed the utilitarian test. So he was opposed to it. And my point, and this is my final point here, is that William Wilberforce and Jeremy Bentham, a Christian and an atheist, despite having little in common with regard to worldview or ultimate values, developed respect for one another and collaborated on the biggest social issues of their day, not just the slave trade, but animal welfare, prison reform, and others, and with great effect. And so in this book, I'm trying to imagine and promote those kinds of discrete alliances and collaborations for our world today. And let me just end with one personal note, a Christian note. Even though this isn't a work of theology, some of my Christian readers have already gotten stuck, if I can say it that way, on questions of evangelism and salvation. Peace building is nice and fine, but shouldn't we really just be trying to convert people in other religions? I don't address that in this book, but I do care about that question, and I have much to say about it. But for now, I'll simply say this. I have spent years of my life as a missionary, as a church planter. I've been involved in discipleship ministries my entire adult life. That's part of my story. But I consider interreligious peace building to be a powerful form of Christian witness all on its own. Not just as a carrot that we use to draw people in so that we can evangelize. God wants peacemakers. Non-proselytizing peace building is a kingdom value. It's one way we contribute to the world that God wants. It's part of our public witness to the good news. So maybe my next book will be called Better Witness. Thank you.
All right. During my lifetime, I have more frequently seen religion associated with terror than with peace, whether that be the images of 9-11 a little over 20 years ago or images from the attacks of January 6th just about two years ago. Much of popular media tells us that religion creates fanatics, fanatics who desire only to widen the chasm that divides our communities because they seek to eliminate all those who differ from their particular creed. Religion only inspires violent and hateful zealots, supposedly not peacemakers. However, my colleague John Barton offers a more hopeful and nuanced view of religion's role in the world in his recent book, Better Religion. As Barton explains, quote, the hijacking of religion is not the only story to tell. While religion certainly possesses the ability to inflict violence on the world, it also has what Barton describes as a peace-able quality, or the capacity for peacemaking. Despite all of the stories of suffering and division that religion has inflicted on the world, Barton reminds us that we also have stories of religions coming together to work for peace and justice, healing and reconciliation. Stories such as that um, that he mentioned in his book of the de-escalation and peace achieved by the Akoi Religious Leaders Peace Initiative in Uganda in the early 2000s against the Lord's Resistance Army led by Joseph Kony. These stories also include a rich repository of texts from the past, like he just mentioned, that can offer models and inspiration for the ways that religions can work together today for human flourishing. For example, Despite historical differences um, and, and the hostilities between Christianity and Islam, the early 18th century witnessed Protestant British writers translating and imitating Islamic and Arabic texts. These women and men contrasted Britain with the Ottoman Empire, and they perceived Islamic culture as offering human rights to women and religious minorities, rights notably denied by a Protestant Britain. One of the writers who encouraged Britain to re-examine Islam's influence in the world was George Sale. In 1734, Sale translated the Quran into English. Although his translation was not the first, his became the standard in England. And it became the standard precisely because he rejected the polemical attacks that other translators prior to him had included, and instead upheld Muhammad as an admirable leader, even as he disagreed with Islam itself. In the dedication to his translation, Sale argues that Muhammad created the best religion and laws that he could for his people. So Sale believed that the British could gain valuable knowledge by examining Islam to understand, quote, the various laws and constitutions of civilized nations, especially of those who flourish in our time. Rather than see the Quran as an object to ridicule or attack, scholars like Sale began to see Islamic cultures as worthy of study, admiration, and even at times imitation. We are fortunate this afternoon to have a copy of Sales Translation with us. Dean Mark Russo procured a first edition of Sales Translation for us here at Pepperdine, and I want to thank him and our archivist Kelsey Knox um, for bringing in texts like this so that we can help our students to engage in these kind of conversations. Um, Kelsey brought our copy of this edition here today. Um, it's going to be right over there in a little bit, and as she mentioned, please don't take food over there. <laughs> um, so, um, though the urge to collaborate with Islam waned over the latter half of the 18th century in Britain and gave way to a more traditional Orientalist logic that sought to control Islam rather than learn from it, Sale and his contemporaries remind us that religions have been able to learn from one another and even work together throughout moments in history. And frequently, scholars and storytellers have been at the forefront of those efforts, just as today. Barton calls us into this hopeful but difficult work. He persuasively argues that, quote, religious dissonance and interreligious collaboration are profoundly compatible. Rather than jettison the convictions and practices that distinguish religion in the name of finding common ground, Barton invites us to embrace the tension of, on the one hand, seeking common good, and on the other, honoring the distinct practices and convictions that we bring. To help us think through this challenge, he offers the metaphor of a bridge. A bridge can span a chasm precisely because of the separate foundations that anchor it on either side. By honoring the unique resources that different faith traditions can contribute to peace, and by respecting the sincerity uh, that inspires those traditions, we can begin to help bring about a more harmonious world for all. 
And this all starts with the stories we tell. For narrative defines the human experience. We use it to organize, define, demarcate, and comprehend the world around us. We perpetuate or challenge our perspectives on the world through our stories. So Barton's call to lean into the tension of faithful commitment while seeking a common good requires us to start telling new stories that can inspire our imaginations, um, which he refers to as like this bubbling up as moments, and help us to create new ways of peace in the world. For as Barton so richly concludes, quote, with a well-informed imagination of religion's peace ableness, the impossible starts to become possible. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Michal Meulenberg. Um, my last name literally means windmill on a hill, so it could not be more Dutch than that. Um, but I am born in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. My birth country is Israel. And so growing up, I learned a lot about the stories and the religious conflict um, that is ongoing there. Um, and um, when my parents moved back to the Netherlands in the 90s, um, as I'm sure you may have followed the news um, if you were alive at that point. <laughs> I know some younger students may not have been. But the war going on in Yugoslavia was very real um, to us as Dutch people. Also, the failure of the Dutch peacekeepers and the disaster that happened with that. And my parents decided to do something about that. And so they took us um, and my, my, uh, myself and my brothers when I was 10 years old going through the war zone in what's no longer Yugoslavia. And so I saw the devastations and the effects, again, of religious and ethnic warfare. Um, and then coming to the United States, um, it was interesting for me when I started engaging with what I didn't realize was evangelical American communities um, and um, starting to become very involved with local church, local mosques, and Muslims really wanted to build relationship with us. And um, so going from small group to small group and churches and saying like, hey, Muslims really want to hang out. Let's do something, right? And um, so one of the first events that we organized, I had 40 Christians willing to show up because we were hosting a huge Christmas dinner at our church. Muslims showed up with 140. And so here I had the hardest time getting an evangelical Christian community to engage Muslims that they didn't have to even go to the mosque. They were coming on our campus to our church. All you have to do is show up to your own church and eat, right? And so um, I want to comment on this book um, from the activist point of view, um, even though I also do scholastic work. Um, and so I love this quote that John Barton has on page two, where he says, while specialists keep generalists grounded and accountable, generalizations are required for meaningful specialization to be possible. And so he and I have had many conversations over the years where he's challenging me to think more in general terms and to philosophize about matters, right, even though he's also a practitioner. Um, and so that expands my mind, right? And then I tell him a lot of stories of what's going on, and I was excited to see my mention um, in the conclusion of that. So a few things that I wanted to, there's so much. First of all, read the book. It's amazing. As you can see, I have so many notes. Um, <laughs> the green ones are practical that I can use in my work in Muslim Christian peace building. Uh, the yellow is what I'm going to use in my classes, right? And then um, the pink is what I want to follow up on with my own book on the more practical applications of all of this. So I thought it was riveting to read. Um, also to mention, Dr. Barton is an incredible writer. Um, and so even though some of these concepts are very hard to grasp, um, especially if you're not a former philosophy background. Um, but I found it really easy to understand, um, even though that's not my background. And I loved kind of the imagery and the metaphors he had in there. So a few things that I wanted to mention. Um, in pa on page nine, um, he is talking about um, how grassroots work is needed in order for it to bubble up and make change. And that reminded me of a quote by Chris Marshall, who says something similar, that if we had enough people on the ground um, having small initiatives that eventually can lead to these tipping points in society where we see societal shifts taking place. And this is what uh, my own uh, work in um, peace studies also is, is con confirming. And so what's interesting is that um, he has a whole section in there also on the importance of engaging people that are of no religion. And um, you make um, a lot of really great arguments um, to counter the concept that is in existence that religion is going to die out, which really reminded me of my Dutch education. Because growing up in the Netherlands, um, which is a predominantly atheist country, I was taught 
religion's on the decline. By the time you guys are adults, there's going to be no more religious people. <laughs> and so um, that only isn't not true, right? I think you have a statistic in there that 90% of the world considers themselves some form of, of religion. That's only increasing, right? But also the complexity of all of that is increasing, uh, which is another thing that um, sparked something in my work that I've done uh, when it comes to this grassroots change that we see taking place. Um, in my own work, um, we've done Muslim Christian peace building where I noticed that a lot of evangelical Christians don't have a Muslim friend. And so we started organizing all these lunches and dinners and events. Um, we kind of called it speed dating for a friend of the other religion. We did played a lot of icebreaker games. And over the years, we've connected over maybe 2,500 Muslims and evangelical Christians with each other. However, it's hard work. Um, and that's why um, the quote that I often said that he had there in the um, conclusion that I do want people to put on my tombstone, at least she tried. Because this is really difficult, right? It's very complex work. Um, and in the process of this, I learned that it's actually very easy for me as an evangelical Christian to love Muslims. It's much harder for me to love evangelical Christians that hate Muslims. And so to really reach back into my family, if you will, um, and to love people out of their hatred, I think that's where the challenge lies. And we have a responsibility to our own communities that we come from to help people out of that. And one quick story is that I had um, a young person in, in the work that we were doing, um, and her dad um, had started a militia group. They were very nervous about the encroachment of Muslims in the United States, and so they decided to stockpile weapons um, and to patrol and to pay attention. This was way before we even had a lot of this um, in the news, right, on a much more um, national stage. And um, she realized that uh, what her dad was doing, had a lot of tough conversations with him. He was an elder in a local church. And she said, Dad, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense for you to join this militia. What are you trying to do, right? Um, and at some point, it got a little bit heated, and she said, if you ever decide to go through with your plans to um, shoot up this mosque um, with people in the militia group, you may be killing your own daughter, because I often go inside and hang out with these Muslims there. And that really clicked and changed something for him, uh, where he went on a journey of um, demilitarizing, if I can call it that, um, getting rid of his guns and materials, no longer joining the militia group, um, and is now best friends with the imam of that mosque. So that's just a small story of things that can happen. That's the beauty. But there's also a lot of hardship and pain um, in that, right? And so um, I think what uh, Dr. Barton is talking about here is extremely important. Um, and I have many more stories, but I have a one-minute warning, and I want to just share a few of that from the grassroots. So um, yeah, read it. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, first of all, my apologies. I am uh, hosting about uh, two dozen attorneys from all over the country for something called a residency program tonight, all day today. So I just ran from there till here. And, but I'm here for this man because I highly regard him and honor him. So I'm skipping my lunch break and I haven't eaten all day. So if I faint here, he's responsible. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you, when I got the copy of the book, I was um, blessed because I know him as an amazing human being and a professor and a friend and a colleague. But the title of the book was something that I thought was beautiful. And it is thought-provoking, and so is the book. I wasn't expecting anything less from Professor Barton. He is a universalist person. He came to me, in fact, he and his wife were one of the first ones to invite us to come to their home when we moved on campus. I perhaps might be the only Sikh person living on campus, if I'm not mistaken. And to be invited to a Christian university, I feel blessed to live here on campus. I feel I have a lot of brothers and sisters and friends here. But just to tell you a little showcase into his soul, he made sure within the first 24 hours I have an invitation. So my wife and I went and we had a discussion, a thought-provoking discussion on intra-faith dialogue. Some of the people, if you look at the book's title in the backside, there are some people who have given acknowledgement about the book. One of them is Bibu Patel, if you look at the title closely, right? And Mr. Patel and I have spoken about him as a person, as an author, 
and he brings that universalist thinking by being a man of faith and i really appreciate that i think you made us think you made us question some of the biases some of us might have and you laid a path for future leaders because i want to connect this last couple of thoughts to my field of dispute resolution to everybody i direct strauss institute for dispute resolution it's a lot of responsibility i'm again blessed and humbled to be a servant there <clears throat> But at the Institute, one of my biggest tensions every day is what's happening, not just within LA or homelessness within LA or LAPD that I'm working with as well, or largely within the West Coast. And let's say, look at the, look at the issue with our Colorado River and negotiations with California, or look nationally and look at all the higher level of suicides and killings that we are witnessing on a daily or if not daily, weekly basis, unfortunately. But look at the global, global level as to where the Ukraine situation is, where Kashmir situation is, where Syria situation is. So in any good faith mind, you cannot be conscious and feel that things are okay. Things are not okay. I can be complicit and accept it, or I can lie to myself and say, oh, things will remain the way they are. And I can just continue doing my job, live in this amazing, do you know, by the way, have anyone been to Delhi recently? In June, and how how was it? Did you like it? Loved it. Loved it. Was it was hot. I mean, India is amazing, right? I I grew up. I still miss it. I've been here 20 years now. But one thing I noticed in Delhi is the pollution. You can't breathe. I was feeling free, but I couldn't breathe. And you come to Malibu. Is one of the worst, the safest places in terms of pollution, right? We are 30. Look it up. I look up every day because I don't want to be 450 where India was. And comparing that, this is a good life. I can just be happy living in Malibu and put that on my CV and Facebook, which I have. <laughs> but the point is, what is the next leadership of the world needs to think and read and be committed to? to resolve some of these conflicts at the global scale. And that is what I think this book, it doesn't have all the answers, I'll tell you that. But Professor Barton had made us start thinking about it, starting with the title. Thank you, my friend, congratulations. So we have some time now for some Q&A from uh, the audience, as well as, as if the panel has questions for each other as well, I want to open it up to everyone. Um, and uh, just sort of to tell you in advance, if you do need to leave for your next commitment, it's all right. Feel free to just quietly exit if that's something that you need, you need to do. Um, and uh, in the back of the room, Jeff is going to be moving around with the mic. Since this event is recorded, um, even if you are quite um, audible to those in the room, we'd appreciate it if you do use the microphone. So, let me open it to the room. Hello, uh, my name is Troy Colazzo. I am a uh, student in the School of Public Policy. Uh, I had a professor, uh, I had a question for Professor Gold. Uh, I know you mentioned that in your book you're gonna talk about more uh, practical uh, implications of the book. Are there any ruminations that you have right now of what those could be? Yeah, working. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I will agree with uh, my colleague over here that this book is incredibly thought provoking. And part of the reason that I latched onto the bridge metaphor was it started to make me think about my classroom um, because I teach classes where I invite students to reflect on how Islam is shaping British imagination. And so when students encounter that, they start to get really uncomfortable because they've seen Islam as being this danger for so long. Um, and so in reading John's book, it helped me to think a bit more, not just about how am I framing the story of Islam, but how am I thinking about letting uh, students frame the stories of their own lives in the classroom and how we might start to say, okay, what is your position in terms of religion? And how can we start to make bridges with Islam from your unique position instead of me just framing that story from them? I'm still figuring out what that's gonna look like, but what I appreciated so much about what John did was that he invited us into this posture of imagination um, so that we could start to say, no, you don't have to leave that part of yourself outside the door, but you can walk into this space. Um, and because of 
the ways that I work with undergrads right now, to me, the classroom seems like the most important space for me to be considering this at the moment. Thank you. Can I insert myself and ask a question, if that's all right? Um, John, we were talking last, okay, so he's a, a podcast host, so I actually had to record a podcast and I called him for some advice. But uh, in that conversation, one of the things I learned is that he's interested in the figure of Roger Williams, who was the founder of Rhode Island. Um, Roger Williams thought it was okay to express contempt for people that you disagree with. It didn't change his idea that you could be part of a larger community with those people. But at the beginning of your book, you said you have to have respect for other people. And I'm wondering if you can um, just clarify a little bit, like what happens when you actually don't like the other person for the things that they believe in and the ways that they express that? And how does that um, work with your theory of interreligious dialogue? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I mean, I, immediately, I would say, and I think we would agree, there's a big difference between expressing um, contempt for ideas and and expressing contempt for people. So at, le at least, even people that hold ideas that I might find. So at least that distinction, I think, is very, very important. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's a, a starting point. But certainly there is a, there is a um, so philosophers talk about appraisal respect. I don't know if that's a phrase that anyone's familiar with, but there is this sense of what I'm calling people for does require respect for, for other people, even people that you may vehemently disagree with or have different worldviews. And there are different levels of respect. I mean, there, you can respect, the, the first level of appraisal respect is you respect you can come to a point where you respect the person, but not their ideas. So you separate what they think with what with who they are, and that's the first level. Um, but that also raises some questions, like how how sustainable is that? Can can you really respect someone if you don't respect their ideas? But at least that's a starting point, and I would say that's a starting point that our country right now is desperately in need of. Um, just to be able to separate um, uh, what we think of ideas from the people that hold those ideas. But at some point, I think once you start on that journey, you have to also start reassessing um, the ideas because if someone that you respect is holding a certain idea, then maybe there's more to that idea than you originally thought. And so trying to uh, struggle your way forward in that, and in, 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 the, in the interreligious peace um, sector at least. Um, some of that may involve just things like, even if I don't understand, even if I completely disagree with someone's worldview or religious convictions, if I see that it produces some moral effect in that person's life, that is valuable. That's something worth holding on to. It's worth um, uh, um, noting. Uh, and then you just have layers of that. And I'll, I'll try to keep this succinct. I'll give one example of that. And it's a Pepperdine example. It's one that I use some. Some of my students have heard this before. Um, I took a group of 40 Pepperdine students down to Culver City a couple of years ago to a Soka Gakkai Buddhist uh, chanting session. If you don't know anything about Soka Gakkai Buddhism, it's a very kind of distinct form of Buddhism, very interesting. But anyway, we were sitting in a room, 40 Pepperdine students, surrounded by 400 Soka Gakkai Buddhists, and they were chanting. And they were, they were going back and forth. They were rubbing beads in their head. This guy up front was banging this gong. They were chanting this nam myo ho renge kyo over and over again, and it was this booming kind of thing. Some of my students were like, what are we doing here? You know, it's a, they didn't know how to perceive some of that. Um, some of them were scared. Some of them felt like, is this right for me as a Christian to be here? And we talked through all those things. But after the chanting, uh, a woman got up, about a 30-year-old woman, Soka Gakkai Buddhist, and she gave her testimony. That's my language. It's not the language they were using, but she was given a testimony. And she said, here's my story. I grew up in LA in a broken home. My mother was on uh, cocaine. My dad was not around. My mom had boyfriends that came in. They, they abused me. She had this horrible story. I won't give all the details, but horrible story. Ended up dropping out of high school, was suicidal. And then a friend asked her to come to the Soka Gakkai Buddhist chanting session. She started chanting. 
And she kind of got her life back together. She, she got her GRE. She went to college. She was now in a master's program at UCLA in clinical psychology. And she said, I've even gotten to the point where through my chanting, I can forgive. I've come to a point where I've forgiven my mother. And I tell my students, all right, on one level, I don't care what your response is to Sukkot Gekai Buddhism. I think it's weird, too. Um, I mean, I don't say it quite like that, but it doesn't, what your assessment of that practice and its set of beliefs are, there is a place for that discussion, but let's put that aside right now. We just heard a fellow human being say that this practice helped her get back into school, overcome suicidal ideation, forgive her mother, things that I would call the fruit of the Spirit. And at least to start by acknowledging that in a fellow human being standing in front of us does something to our respect that moves us along a continuum. Um, I am no closer today to agreeing with the worldview of Sukkot Gakkai Buddhism. But man, I had a sister up there that was sharing something that my Christian faith actually requires me to respect and to try to learn from. And so that's an anecdote that goes with the idea. Um, thank you, John. I, I, yeah, I'm a big admirer of John. Um, so I, I guess I had a couple, a couple thoughts that are questions at the end that just how ideology and religion work with each other. So one thought I had is like a skeptical uh, traditionalist friend of mine might say, well, it's not a bridge at all. Really, what you're trying to do is push all of religion over into liberalizing. Um, and, and so um, what would you say back to that is one thought. Um, is this uh, is this true difference or is it ideological homogenization? And then also, is there something specific about religion, the world's religions, to you that has these kind of deeper sources you just movingly described that other things don't, like things we want to throw out, like maybe I'm totally wrong here and need to be corrected, but like Scientology or um, or or ideology itself, like is does ideology not have certain resources that that the world's religions need in some way, um, in this sense? Yeah, I mean, I've, thank you, Jason. Um, uh, some of those questions I want to turn right back on to you and say, teach me, you know, that you're asking some really big questions that I know you think about a lot about. Um, you know, what, 25 words or less, so what can I say here? One thing I would say about the liberalizing, like do religions just need to liberalize? All right, there's, there, I think there's some really important discussions to have there, but one thing I would respond to just practically in our world is if that's what's needed in our world, then we're in trouble. Um, because there are so many forces and trends going in different directions and other directions from that. Um, and so I want to ask, okay, so what about the world that isn't liberalizing? And, um, and at least what I want to explore there is that it seems like the major religious traditions have these deep, long-standing, well-tested resources, all of them, ethical resources especially that overlap, that have motivated intelligent people for centuries and centuries and have pushed them in some directions that I'm calling peaceful. Um, and so, you know, obviously much more could be said about all of that. I am not backing off, and I don't in this book, I'm not backing off from, I, well, let me say this, I'm not saying that, oh, let's just, anything that calls itself a religion, we just need to respect it and embrace it, and they, they probably are ready for me to build a bridge. And I'm not saying that. There's all kinds of critical evaluations that need to come in here, and all kinds of assessments that are part of this. And and how does religion relate to other ideologies and other movements? And I, I'm, I'm just inviting people in and inviting myself in to those complicated dialogues. Um, but I certainly think the major traditions have these deep resources to draw on. Um, I was going to say something else I thought was really, really important, and I've lost it. So it may not be as important as I thought. But, uh, but I, anyway, there's a starting point, I would say. I think we have time for two more. So one for Stuart and then one more after that. And I think maybe you can get John to sign some books. <laughs> I was struck by uh, your comments and your use of the word hatred. I'm, I'm glad you used the word. It probably is the word that hit me the most in all this. Um, in your, both of your work on uh, trying to build interreligious dialogue, and when you confront hatred, um, from your experience, how much of that hatred is based in fear 
and in particular, uh, fear of being replaced. Um, I feel like I see this in this replacement theory stuff that's a part of American culture these days, uh, but then also in interreligious dialogue, this fear that, okay, this religious group has kind of moved into the neighborhood and we can tolerate a few of them, but then when the numbers kind of get large enough, then people start fearing that their way of life and their culture and their tribe uh, is on the way out. Um, is that is that a part of the dynamic uh, that you're uh, that you confront uh, and that you see play out in these types of dialogues? I have a response, but I, I talked several times. Um, yeah, no, there's there's so many layers to that um, that are extremely important to unpack. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but um, it's definitely in the book. It's it's being talked about. Um, I have a great friend also that wrote a book on, um, uh, particularly when Christians are in a minority and a Muslim majority context. And so there's a lot to learn there. But there's also a lot of um, bitterness from some people that then come to the United States. So there's so there's many layers to it. Um, I think there what Dr. Barton is trying to say in the book is that there's resources. Um, to be found in faith, in religion, that can help with that response. And that's called the better religion, right? And so there's a, um, a way that you can cherry pick verses and say like, hey, my faith justifies for me to now um, react out of fear and out of, hey, I'm being overtaken by something, right? Um, but there's also resources in that same faith that can do the opposite of, hey, am I find myself in an increasing minority or am I find myself, I mean, in some contexts, that's very real, right? It could be your whole life a danger in certain places of the world, um, and there can also be beautiful things that happen. Um, one good friend of mine did a lot of work in Iraq, um, and when ISIS came into Mosul, um, the ISIS started painting the letter N on the doors of where Christians were living, which is the word for Nazarene, which is Christian in the Quran. And the Muslim neighbors who were disagreeing with ISIS about that also put an N on their doors. Now imagine that. It's very similar to what happened in the Holocaust where people, when Jews had to wear um, uh, stars, that other people that were non-Jewish also started wearing stars. And so they now have, um, they, could, oh, they were just as afraid of ISIS as the Christians were. They're not being marked, but they said, we're going to be marked with our neighbor facing potential death at the hands of ISIS because they don't want our Christian neighbors to be um, you know, marked in that sense. So my stories primarily come from Muslim Christian relations. I'm sure there's stories for all religions to talk like that. Um, but I think, yeah, fear is 100% at the root of any kind of hatred, I think. And I think there's, um, a, lot, a lot, especially when I talk with students who have issues with their parents or grandparents, um, sometimes it's very generational. I say, you cannot argue people out of their fear. You have to love them out of their fear. And so that's where I think the challenge then comes in to listen, to make people feel heard and understood. But understanding is not the same as agreement. And so people do need to move away from that hatred at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I would just simply uh, or briefly add, and I appreciate the question, um, to use the language that I use, fear is at the root of all religious malfunctions. Um, it, fear is what's behind religions being hijacked for hatred. Um, and, you know, there's a reason why do not be afraid is the most repeated refrain in the entire Bible and in the teachings of Jesus. Um, so I, I would just add that. Yeah. I'll, I'll recommend this. I'm, I think this is, I'm breaking some protocol by recommending another book on my friend's book launch. But there's a book by a Vietnamese monk who we lost last year, Thich Nhat Hanh, And the title of the book is Fear. And I'm reading it right now, and it's a beautiful book. If I highly, he has written more than 30 books. Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese monk, and he looks at Buddhism's perspective on fear. Powerful. So I have a question for both um, Dr. Singh and um, Dr. Muhlenberg. Um, so, so far we have been taking a um, pacifist approach towards um, the differences in world religions, ideologies. And um, we've, tried, we've been trying to mediate between the um, tensions, and so far we have been successful. But then the problem I have is, when, if we were to face a condition where the Mutual exclusiveness just cannot be pacified or mediated. What can we do? And um, the examples I have in mind for both of you correspondingly would be, how do you guys see Pakistan and Palestine? Pakistan and Palestine. 
I, I thought I, I'll come here and have easy questions, but <laughs> I think we, a couple of you, my colleagues have mentioned listening, and I've just given a lecture, hour-long lecture on listening. We talk about listening, but we don't listen. We all like to speak more than we hear. And I think Professor Barton's point about listening to other faiths, it not, as he mentions clearly in the book and otherwise too today too, it's not about agreement, it's about giving respect. It's about creating identity. Each one of us like to create a meaning in life. As a Sikh man, meaning to life for me is a lot to do with what we do every prayer, which is Sarbat Dapala. And since you all know Punjabi, I can move on from there, right? <laughs> Uh, which basically translates to, may everyone be blessed. So every day in my prayer, I end the prayer by saying, Sarbat Apala, may everyone be blessed. And you may think that as a turban-wearing person living on Pepperdine campus, I may feel different. But I'm going to tell you a beautiful story, indirect answer to your question. And I think there's an answer in there. Last year during COVID, a year and a half ago, my father, who I'm very close to, uh, was diagnosed with a heart disease. And we learned that he had to go through triple heart surgery. My father is also very severely diabetic. He's, of course, elderly. And we, I was very worried. So I went to our law school Christian community, Christian Law Society, and I requested them to do a prayer for my father. Not only they did the beautiful prayer, I was invited. Students came back to me. They wrote me emails. I have never felt so much warmth. I almost want to say it from my own community, but I won't go there. Um, from another members of his, his emotional faith. And I felt like there is no difference. I felt like they cared for my father like it's their father. Of course, for the power of all those prayers, my father came out. He was very worried going into surgery. When he came out, he like, of course I was going to be okay. I said, yes, dad. <laughs> Palestine and Pakistan. Are you listening? They are human beings too. First of all, do not degrade anybody. Everybody has a right to live. What if you were born in one of those countries? What if there's an amazing uh, Jewish author, Ailar Sachar, out of Toronto. She writes a nice essay titled, Lottery by Birth. How many of us in this room are precisely at this moment in this room because we hit lottery at our birth? My father was a vice president, then president of a university. Guess what? I'm teaching law. He's a law professor. Guess what? I'm a law professor. So my first and only point here is, before even you think about Pakistan and Palestine, have you gone there? Have you lived there? Have you met a friend? I have not been to Pakistan or Palestine. My father has to both places. So I'll end by telling you this. When he was invited to Pakistan, he went to visit an old Sikh temple that we have been, of course, away from. He's never, he's been to many countries. I've been to 50 plus countries too. But he said, Suksuman, I need to know one thing. And one day you should go there. And I did not go there purposefully because I want to get American visa. People who visited Pakistan from India did not get American visa. Of course, there's no bias. So of course, I got the visa and the citizenship and all of that. But he came back and he showed me his wallet. It was full of money. And I promise I'll be done after this. And I'm like, okay, what do I notice with this? He said, what an amazing brothers and sisters, mostly brothers because it's men who treat you as if you're a man. I said, what do you mean? I still don't get it. He said, the moment we landed in Karachi, nobody let us take our wallet out. Yeah, I think, and I would love to talk more with you. Um, and what may be behind the question is, what do we do with deep suffering and, and deep like, like almost existential problems that people are facing, right, when they're dying. Um, and um, Dr. Barton, again, in the book, what I find so beautiful is that he distinguishes between optimism and hope. He says, I have no optimism, but there is hope. Right? And I agree with that. I think um, when, especially as a young girl going through war zones, seeing the bullet holes in the, in the houses, um, playing with refugee children and hearing the next day that's been bombed and those kids are gone, right? I think there, there are no easy answers, and any easy answer is, is unhelpful. Um, but we have to have moral imagination. So can we, even in the midst of deep suffering, deep pain, um, long, like, impossible to see things that, like, we still have to have hope? And that's, again, why I want to put on my tombstone, at least she tried. Like, we got to do something, even if we don't, maybe in our lifetime, see enough 
happen, we have to do something. And that's where hope comes in. Yeah. I think that is a wonderful point to stop our conversation for right now with a little bit of hope. Please join me in thanking our panelists and John. And I hope we see you all here next Friday at 12 noon for the next library book event. Thank you.